David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, November 5th, 2021. Time for another show. And I'll be doing this one, uh, what do we say, ahead of time so that it's uh, virtually live for you. I know we said live right in the beginning. I guess that's a lie. I should just close up shop at this point. Okay, well, uh, I had mentioned to you that uh, there was the New Jersey road trip coming up on Friday. And uh, now that I have the opportunity to maybe get the road trip underway a little earlier, I thought it might be wise to record ahead of time. So I'm going to do it and uh, share with you a couple of stories that, uh, let's see, well, some of them would have made great follow-ups if we had had more time yesterday, which is, of course, for me, just a couple minutes ago. And so, okay, I figured it would make for a good follow-up to... uh, Give you what broke in the afternoon as far as news goes. There's a couple follow-up pieces on, oh, the Florida, University of Florida uh, professors who have been blocked from testifying by Ron DeSantis and some new information on them. Uh, Some things to think about with respect to Loudoun County, yet more about that. And I guess some reporting results from, let's see, what went on in court for Trump during his hearing over the uh, privilege claims that he was making that Armando spoke to us about yesterday slash not that long ago. Uh, The hearings, of course, did take place right after we signed off and Armando watched and critiqued along the way and it doesn't sound like he got what he was hoping for, although I think it was he was hoping against hope that he would hear his theories expounded in the courtroom, and I guess that didn't happen. But there was at least some healthy skepticism reported by S.V. Dante for HuffPost uh, on the part of the judge in the case, which sounds like things are on track anyway. So we'll share with you that piece uh, written yesterday slash just a few minutes ago. It's actually stretched into hours by now. But Judge seems skeptical of Trump's attempt to cover up his role in the January 6th insurrection, is the headline that S.V. Date gets to work with here. Subheader says, a federal judge kept coming back to a fundamental issue. Isn't the question of asserting executive privilege best handled by the current executive? Well, Not unfamiliar territory, of course, given what we heard from Armando, but uh, we'll see whether any greater specifics are outlined. The, uh, The piece reads this way, former President Donald Trump's attempt to use, and I like that he encloses this in scare quotes properly here, executive privilege, to cover up his actions before and during the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, ran into a federal judge Thursday who appeared unconvinced by his arguments. U.S. District Court Judge Tanya Chutkin, Chutkin, I'm not sure how she pronounces this, wondered what the basis was for even questioning President Joe Biden's decision to release documents related to the insurrection, given that case law states that the current president is presumed to be acting in the national interest in such matters. Doesn't sound that far off from what Armando was telling us he was looking for. But of course, we got greater detail on our show yesterday than most. Well, let's see. We'll continue on here. The judge asks the Trump lawyer here, Justin Clark, appearing for Trump in this instance, or at least answering this question, isn't the best person to determine executive privilege the executive? Chutkin asked Trump lawyer Justin Clark. That's pretty good. Clark answered, not the incumbent executive, which, you know, he has to answer that way in order to make his case. But it's, you know, bumper sticker level dumb, right? You know, I mean, executive privilege. Whose privilege is it? The executive. 
the current executive, it, it, we didn't have room on the sticker for former, sir, but, you know, we could have used smaller type. I know where they have that stuff. It's executive privilege. Thursday's hearing was meant to determine whether an injunction should be issued to block the National Archives' November 12th release of the first set of documents from Trump and his staff to the House Select Committee investigating the events of January 6th. Trump's lawyers had argued that a 1974 Supreme Court case regarding Richard Nixon's attempts to have White House recordings that he made destroyed after he resigned from office gave Trump the right to assert privilege even if Biden refused to do so. But Chutkin pointed out that Congress had superseded that case by passing the Presidential Records Act in 1978, which gives the sitting president the ultimate decision on whether to assert privilege. I'm not sure that case is helpful to you, or at least as helpful to you as you think it is. Chutkin told Clark, she added that Congress seemed to have a legitimate interest in finding out how the insurrection came to be. It seems that way. I mean, not only was there an attack, but it was an attack on Congress. I think they probably uh, shouldn't have much difficulty establishing a legitimate interest. But okay. She added that Congress seemed to have a legitimate interest in finding out, seemed to, hmm? the uh, legitimate interest in finding out how the insurrection came to be. The January 6th riot happened in the Capitol. That's literally Congress's house. Hmm. So it is. Clark further argued that Chutkin needed to grant an injunction blocking next week's scheduled release because Trump would suffer irreparable harm if she didn't. Don't threaten me with a good time. When those documents are out the door and go to Congress, they are out, he said. Yeah, at least they are. Chutkin said she agreed that releasing the papers was irreversible, but asked what basis Trump had to keep them secret, given that they are all public records. We're talking about documents that are quintessentially about government business, are we not? She said, where is the harm? Tell me the harm. The harm exists to the institution of the presidency, Clark responded, to which Chutkin countered, well, the current president disagreed. Shouldn't that weigh in? Mm -hmm. Chutkin said she did agree with Trump's lawyers on one point, that the committee's requests for documents seemed alarmingly broad, that's in quotes, asking for some records going back to April of 2020, including polling data. Douglas Letter, House General Counsel, said that date was relevant because it was when Trump began falsely claiming in Twitter posts that the coming election would be rigged if he lost. I imagine it was even earlier than that. But okay, Chutkin, though, wondered whether trying to make sense of Trump's tweets was a good use of time. <laughs> That's a loaded question. I'm not sure there is an answer about why the president was tweeting what he was tweeting, she said. Letter added that the question of relevance and broadness was not one for the federal judiciary to decide. They are broad, Your Honor, but it's a separation of powers issue. Mm. That's for Congress to decide, he said. That's not a bad idea. The president himself was fomenting this attack on Congress. Both Letter and Justice Department lawyer Elizabeth Shapiro, representing the National Archives, said that the 1978 law, Presidential Records Act, spells out how disputes about executive privilege between current and former presidents are to be handled, with the deference going to the current one. Seems to make sense. I mean, you know that we think it makes sense. We told you earlier. They are records of the United States, Shapiro said. He is not personally injured by their disclosure. Chutkin, who was appointed to the federal bench by former President Barack Obama in 2014, has earned a reputation for seeing the January 6th attack as a serious threat against the United States and has at times given harsher sentences to insurrectionists than those recommended by prosecutors. There have to be consequences for participating in an attempted violent overthrow of the government beyond sitting at home, she said in one case. At the conclusion of Thursday's hour-and-a-half hearing, the judge said that she was cognizant of the January, oh, I'm sorry, the November 12th deadline. I will issue my opinion expeditiously. 
And by the way, that, did you catch that? It's a little hint about how much time has passed in between the taping of the shows. I said it was a few minutes. It's, there, there's, it could be described as a number of minutes. It can be expressed in minutes. But obviously, you see, the hour and a half hearing on Thursday would have had to come and go and then be written up in HuffPost in order for me to have a chance to read you this. Trump became the first president in 232 years of U.S. elections to refuse to turn over power peacefully to his successor. It does seem like a serious problem, doesn't it? He spent weeks attacking the legitimacy of the November 3rd contest he lost, starting his lies in the pre-dawn hours of November 4th that he had really won in a, quote, landslide and that his victory was being stolen from him. Those falsehoods continued through a long string of failed lawsuits challenging the results in a handful of states, Trump and some of his advisors even discussed using the United States military by invoking the Insurrection Act or declaring martial law to retain power, despite having lost the election, including by seizing voting machines and ordering revotes in states Biden narrowly won. But military leaders had made clear that they would not involve themselves in the political process. So after the Electoral College finally voted on December 14th, making Biden's win official, Trump instead turned to a last-ditch scheme to pressure his own vice president into canceling the ballots of millions of voters in several states Biden won and declaring Trump the winner during the pro forma congressional certification of the election results on January 6th. Well expressed and with good detail there. S.V. If, can I call you S.? Okay, well, I don't know whether I can or not. He's not answering me. Trump asked his followers to come to Washington that day and then told the tens of thousands who showed up to march on the Capitol to intimidate Vice President Mike Pence into doing what Trump wanted. When you catch somebody in a fraud, you're allowed to go by very different rules, Trump said. Do you remember how he said that? I don't know if it was quite like that, but I imagine that's what he would emphasize. The mob of supporters he incited attempted to do his bidding by storming the building. They even chanted, Hang Mike Pence, after Pence refused to comply with Trump's demands. A police officer, of course, died after being assaulted during the insurrection, and four others took their own lives in the days and weeks that followed. One of the rioters was fatally shot as he, uh, she climbed through a broken window into an anteroom containing still evacuating House members, and three others in the crowd died during the melee. While the House impeached Trump for inciting the attack, all but seven Senate Republicans, led by their leader, Kentucky's Mitch McConnell, chose not to convict him, thereby letting Trump continue his political career even as, fa as, hmm, as he faces, should say, several investigations into his post-election actions. Trump and his allies are now engaged in a campaign to portray the rioter who was shot, Ashley Babbitt, as a martyr and the hundreds of others who have been arrested as victims of political persecution. Trump himself continues to suggest he will run for the 2024 GOP nomination and is using his Save America committee's money to continue spreading the same falsehoods that culminated in the violence of January 6th. So I think good job, well covered there. I appreciate his angle on the uh, on, on picking up the story and the way he tells it. Uh, what struck me at the end of this story was uh, once again the fact that what four other Capitol police officers took their own lives, committed suicide in the days and weeks that followed. And it's not that we've forgotten that, but I don't know. It doesn't get emphasized enough, and I don't know. Maybe we don't know what to do with that, but. It occurs to me, for instance, that, uh, where do I still have this story in pocket? I feel like I put something aside on this the other day. Oh, no. Um, I did read it. I, I did share it. It was the one about the judge. And I think, uh, yeah, let's see if I can find it in the archives of, uh, of pocket. But so I get the judge's name right. But yeah, here we go. Do you remember... Reading the story uh, from CNN, the headline was top D.C. federal judge criticizes schizophrenic Justice Department approach to January 6th cases. It was 
uh, Judge Beryl Howell of the D.C. District Court, uh, essentially voicing the complaint that, well, I'm having a hard time reconciling how prosecutors come in here with uh, arguments and pleadings that say this was an attack on the very fabric of our democracy and uh, put democracy and uh, the American way of life itself at risk and then charge everybody with misdemeanors and ask for maybe, you know, 45 days in jail or, uh, you know, home confinement even or, you know, probation entirely, no jail time at all. Um, and, you know, I, I understand some of the theories that have been floated about why they would be doing that, of course. But um, it struck me as I was reading and was reminded about the four officers that killed themselves afterwards. I mean, that seems to me like it could be included maybe in the judge's complaints even. And, you know, I hope I hope that prosecutors are saving things up for you know, frying some really big fish in all of this. But, you know, I mean, I've been disappointed before. I've been hurt before. And so I don't want to commit. Yeah. Uh, but really, you can, you know, you can see why I would be disappointed in such things. But if they ever got around to actually pressing a case against some of the big fish, like maybe even the biggest fish, uh, I would hope that that would become part of the argument too, right? We... We all agree, well, Republicans don't agree, obviously, but we, all the normal people agree that this was a, a very, very bad thing. You know, an attack, yes, on American democracy, period. I mean, there's really, it, 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 to me, it's not far-fetched to describe it that way. But then, I, I, I don't know, maybe it would be even more powerful, or maybe just for us, our empathetic audience that we have here, to to say, you know, this, I can't find a, a reason why this should have any bearing on the, the legal issues at stake here, but just plain tugging at the jury's heartstrings, and maybe that's why it wouldn't be, you know, permissible. But it seems to me, maybe somewhere, the narrative, it needs to be told. You know, there were four police officers who were so shattered by the fact that their fellow Americans had risen in insurrection off of this insane a-hole liars crap and had sent them there. And after all of the, you know, months now of back the blue and, uh, and, and, and insisting that they were the ones who supported cops, but only if they agree with us politically and don't try to prevent us from doing something like sacking the capital of the United States to hang the vice president and install the guy who lost overwhelmingly as president instead. And that you guys wouldn't see the, the idiocy of doing something like this and would abandon all your principles of back the blue, et cetera, et cetera, and law and order. And we're going to put him back in office because he's the law and order president. They were so shattered by this. It was like, I don't even want to live in this country anymore. I mean, some people say that and they head to Canada. These four said, in addition to the, the physical trauma of having gone through the day, I can't, I can't go on. I cannot continue to live literally in a world where this is even a possibility. That's how serious people who had, in fact, you know, made a life, made a career of defending this, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word, we don't we don't use the word palace lightly here in this country. But this, you know, this bastion, this home, the palace in which democracy is supposed to reside. And to, to think that their fellow Americans thought that they were in the right to come and crush them like literally crush them, beat them over the head, drag them down the stairs, spit on them, scream, stomp, spray them in the face with mace, threaten to come back with guns. And by the way, if you don't get out of our way, we'll get you too. Hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence. Put the criminal back in office for law and order's sake. I mean, even if you just don't believe the over the top stuff, or you think it's over the top, it isn't. But maybe if you think it's over the top to say it was a, an attack on democracy itself, then just 
think about what it means for the cops to have survived this thing and then still said, I just see no hope of getting out of this. There's too many of them too far gone. You know, I, I'm surprised. I mean, I I almost expected to to see it happen again. Like the other day, we didn't discuss this story. I forgot to, to bring it up. But the fact that there were people, hundreds, I guess, lined up outside in, in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, claiming that they were, what, waiting for JFK Jr. to reveal that he had faked his own death 22 years ago. As one comedian on Twitter put it, he faked his death 22 years ago so that he could come back and be vice president. Like, really, come on. The likelihood of that. But I I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm wondering whether that would have driven some of them over the edge. It's the kind of thing that makes me think, how are we going to get out of this? There's just no possibility of finding a way home from here, given that this is happening. There are really people out here waiting for JFK Jr. to come out. I don't know. To me, you know, uh, I don't know. It makes for good narrative, but I guess, yeah, thinking about whether or not you'd really be able to uh, to, to, to lay that story out in court, yeah, probably not. It would be uh, significantly more prejudicial than probative, as they say, and not certain we could get that entered into evidence. But uh, maybe in the closing arguments, perhaps. Uh, or at sentencing. Anyway, I, I just thought I would share that with you. That that occurred to me and uh, figured I'd just spill it on a, on a Friday. Hey, speaking of January 6th and HuffPost, would you mind if I told you another story from at a HuffPost? Ryan Riley, who covers, uh, at least I see him on Twitter all the time, covering all of the investigations and trials of January 6th rioters, has one among... Many spectacular stories from, uh, from from growing from out of that event. Uh, love the headline, of course. January sixth, defendant who said she's quote definitely not going to jail, sentenced to prison. Um, I think she's actually I don't know. Is she spending time in federal prison or is she actually going to jail? It would have been great to finish it with jail if that's where she's going. Jenna Ryan is the person in question. You may remember her as. The uh, Texas real estate agent who flew to D.C. on a private plane and then live streamed from inside the Capitol. She's the one getting 60 days in prison. And here's the deal. Jenna Ryan, a Donald Trump enthusiast. It's a good way of putting it. Who tweeted that she's, quote, definitely not going to jail after she stormed the Capitol on January 6th, was sentenced to 60 days in prison on Thursday. U.S. District Judge Christopher Cooper said Ryan, a real estate agent from Texas who flew to D.C. on a private plane and promoted her business as she live-streamed in the Capitol, played a, quote, lesser role in the criminal conduct that took place than many others did, but that does not mean that you don't have any culpability in what happened that day, Cooper said. When she chose to leave her hotel room, she knew she was going to something that wasn't a peaceful protest, Cooper said. I don't think you could have missed the fact that this was no peaceful protest, Cooper said. You were a cheerleader. You cheered it on. Ryan, who faced four charges, pleaded guilty to one misdemeanor count, admitting she paraded, demonstrated, or picketed inside the Capitol when she knew that she didn't have permission to be there. You're not being singled out for your political views or anything like that, Cooper said. It's how and where you decided to express them. In a letter to Judge Cooper, Ryan sought to downplay her actions that day. Some actions I took that day were good, she wrote, and there are fine people on both sides, right? I came to D.C. to protest the election results. I wanted my voice to be heard. My only weapon was my voice and my cell phone. Ryan denied in her letter that a tweet where she wrote that she had, quote, blonde hair, white skin, a great job, a great future, and I'm not going to jail, didn't indicate that she was above the law. I wasn't saying that I was above prison. I just felt it would be unlikely since I was pleading to entering the Capitol for two minutes and eight seconds. Now I realize that was a false notion, but I 
But having a false notion does not automatically mean I deserve incarceration, she wrote. Mm. No, but you really did step in it, didn't you? You're tempting fate. A tweet of me taking up for myself against a bully who is harassing me does not indicate that I feel above the law. So once again, she's the victim in all of this. When Cooper brought up Ryan's comments on Twitter, Ryan told the judge that she just shouldn't tweet. (laughs) Well, that's probably true. Uh, At the end of the hearing, Judge Cooper also advised Ryan to think about what sources she relied upon for her news in the future. The FBI has made more than 650 arrests in connection with the Capitol attack. We are helpfully reminded about one fourth of the total number of potential defendants who committed chargeable conduct that day. All right. Well, just wanted to catch up on that one and let you know what happened to the lady who said she definitely wasn't going to jail. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm about to uh, launch a rebranding, I think, of this show into uh, HuffPost Radio News, I guess. I have one more item from HuffPost about uh, January 6th, or January 6th related, anyway, that I'd like to share with you, except, uh, of course, we're coming up on our first break, if I can make this thing work, since we're not working in real time, uh, I'd like to build it like the regular shows here uh so let me i'll tease you with this and then come back with the content i think we can get away with that sort of break here this by christopher matthias writing again in Huff post at least 10 republicans who were at the january 6th rally just got elected to office and even more attendees of the rally that turned into the Capitol riot will likely be on the ballot in 2022. Want to find out the details and who they are? Well, we'll be right back with more about that next. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netflix Radio. We continue on with now the reading of the article. At least 10 Republicans who are at the January 6th rally just got elected to office rather than, say, thrown in jail. At least 10 Republicans, oh, I'm going to repeat myself, but this is the headline and the first sentence of the piece. You can hardly blame me. I didn't know this. At least 10 Republicans who attended the January 6th rally in Washington, D.C., that turned into a deadly insurrection, new word here, were elected to office on Tuesday. Three were elected to state legislatures and seven won positions at the local level. Although most have claimed they didn't breach the U.S. Capitol on that day. It's, uh, you know, it's a difference. All were participants in the demonstration leading up to the attack, standing alongside extremists to take part in the finale of a months-long anti-democratic campaign to falsely claim that then-President Donald Trump hadn't really lost the 2020 election. Their victories on Tuesday are a possible sign of things to come. HuffPost previously identified at least 57 state and local GOP officials who attended the January 6th rally, many of whom will be up for re-election and will likely keep office next year. That these candidates enjoy the support of the wider Republican Party and are winning elections does not bode well for American democracy. I guess it's the sort of thing that might make a Capitol Police officer from that day take his own life. 
showing that one of the country's major political parties, despite some initial gestures at being horrified by the events of January 6th, is almost completely unrepentant over its role in fomenting the historic attack on the Capitol. Among the January 6th attendees who won office on Tuesday were two Republicans elected to the Virginia House of Delegates, boo, Dave LaRock and John McGuire. Earlier this year, LaRock, responding to criticism from a black elected official about his role in the insurrection, said the official should focus on, quote, the needs of the colored community. Ah. He later apologized for the comment. Okay, so never mind. He's apologized. McGuire won his seat despite his Democratic opponent unearthing a photo showing him standing near men in paramilitary gear confronting police on January 6th. McGuire had previously claimed he hadn't heard of the violence at the U.S. Capitol until returning home. The news, he said, had shocked and horrified him. Marie March, a restaurant owner who bragged in a campaign advertisement about her attendance at the January 6th Stop the Steal rally and who, in a since-deleted Facebook post, warned of a, quote, coming civil war in which she would be willing to, quote, fight and die for both her family and small businesses as well. Everyone wants to, I would fight and die for small businesses. I'd say get on with it at this point, but all right. Well, she also won a seat in the Virginia House of Delegates on Tuesday. In city councils across the country, January 6th rally attendee Natalie Jangula, I don't know, Jangula, J-A-N-G-U-L-A, won a seat in Nampa, Idaho, and Christine Eid, Eid, E-A-D, who did not enter the Capitol building and later wrote a Facebook post falsely blaming the violence on Antifa and other anarchists, won a seat in Wachung, New Jersey. That's bad news, too. I'll have to stop by in Wachung and, and give her a piece of my mind, but probably not. Wouldn't know what to do with it anyway. Charles Osberger won a seat in the town council of Mansfield, Connecticut. An official at the town clerk's office confirmed to HuffPost. Osberger didn't have to campaign too hard, though. There were only eight candidates for the nine-seat council. <laughs> Told you. Yeah, right. Greg's right. It's a small town. Everybody knows each other, and there aren't even enough people to go around to know one another. How do you like that? I know everyone. I know more people than there are in this town, in this town. You see? I don't know. I think I had to add the extra in this town in order to make it make sense. Because everybody knows people other than people. In ah, forget it. Anyway, Susan Soloway is next. She helped organize a bus to transport Trump supporters to the January 6th rally. And she won re-election to the Hunterdon County, New Jersey Board of Directors. Is that right? Board of, do they call it that now? When I was there, they were the Board of Chosen Freeholders. Have they up, up, updated the, the language and now call them the Board of Directors? Hmm. Soloway attended the rally, and I guess so, she had a bus anyway, and later posted on Facebook a selfie outside the Capitol, which really you should be sentenced just for taking selfies, generally, which she later deleted. She claims not to have entered the building and to have turned over footage she took at the riot to the FBI. Hmm. Uh, under what circumstances? I don't know. In Braintree, Massachusetts, a former high school teacher who resigned his position after local activists sent a photo of him outside the Capitol on January 6th to the FBI, won a seat on the local school committee. So that'll be fun, too. Matthew Lynch received the second most votes in the six-candidate race for three open school committee seats. He told Patch earlier this year that the FBI has visited him twice since January 6th, but did not elaborate on what occurred during those interviews. In his correspondence with Patch, he accused the activists of slandering me as a domestic terrorist and called them a digital lynch mob. It's unclear if he breached the Capitol building, but I'd like to find out. And in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, husband-wife duo Danielle and Stephen 
Lindemuth, who were part of a bus trip to the rally from nearby Lancaster, won two seats on the school board, husband and wife on the school board. The couple, according to the Lancaster Online, campaigned on promising to keep, yeah, you heard it here, critical race theory. to keep critical race theory and the 1619 project both of them out of schools in a march school board meeting on zoom the couple who have said multiple bigoted things online sounds fun complained about a poster in their daughter's classroom depicting black lives matter protesters Stephen Lindemuth told the school board that Black Lives Matter was a, quote, Marxist organization with anti-American values that are largely anti-family. We'll see about that. And by the way, I was just sort of thinking like, I don't know, I guess the fact that the, the fact that it was a school board meeting on Zoom made me think Zoom now just makes me think of Jeffrey Tubin every time. And I'm wondering, well, if you thought that was crazy, where do you see what a husband and wife duo who are on the school board do during Zoom meetings of the school board later on uh, because of how pro-family they are? Whatever. At least one race involving a January 6th attendee is still undecided. Monica Manthe, I guess that that is M-A-N-T-H-E-Y. Monica Manthe is still awaiting results in her race to join the Annapolis, Maryland City Council. I'm not a crazy insurrectionist person, Manthe, who attended the rally, but claimed she didn't enter the Capitol building on January 6th, insisted to HuffPost on Wednesday morning. Asked if the riot made her rethink her support of Trump, Manthe replied, I never rethought my support. So she is a crazy insurrectionist person. Elsewhere across the country, at least five January 6th attendees were defeated at the ballot box. That's good news. In Virginia, two candidates, two of them won or three of them won, but uh, two got defeated. This is good news. Maureen Brody and Philip Hamilton both lost their bids to join the House of Delegates. That's good news. Steve Lynch, who pushed debunked conspiracy theories that the siege of the Capitol was a false flag event carried out by leftists, lost his race for county executive in Northampton County, Pennsylvania. Incumbent T.J. Onerlaw, I guess, O-N-E-R-L-A-W, who said he got pretty darn close to where the door is at the Capitol, but was unaware until later that night that anyone had breached the building, sure, was defeated in his quest for another term in the Mason, Ohio City Council. And Edward Durfee Jr., that's a great name, hey, Durfee, Edward Durfee Jr., a member of the far-right militia, the Oath Keepers, a group heavily implicated in the violence on January 6th, lost a race for a seat in the New Jersey General Assembly. Durfee, who previously told BuzzFeed News he did not storm the Capitol, but was working as security for the Oath Keepers, who needed security because reasons, currently heads up the Republican Party in Northvale, New Jersey. And uh, let's see, earlier today, I saw a video of the, I think, the truck driver guy that, uh, that, that Greg told us, uh, I wasn't sure whether he told us that this guy had won or had narrowly lost this seat in the race for General Assembly or maybe the State Senate. And I saw his video circulating. I'll see if I can dig it up. And it was confusing to me because he was he was saying something kind of, you know, not not dopey, but just, you know, like what? This, this, I don't even know what he's trying to get at here. Oh, yes. He was uh, being interviewed on Fox and was asked, uh, I guess, what are you going to do? What's the first thing you're going to do when you get there? So I guess Fox, whenever this video was taken, I, I'm still unclear. I guess I have to look up, did he win or not? I can't remember what Greg told us. But Fox seems convinced that he won. So what are you going to do when you get there? What's the first thing you're going to do? And he says, I really don't know. That's the key factor. I don't know what I don't know, so I will learn what I need to know, which is, a, you know, I mean, it makes you sound like you don't know what you're doing, but he does He's not a professional politician. I don't fault him too much for that. He's going to go and I'll find out how to be a legislator. And then I'm going to figure out how to do what I want to do. And it's not that bad. But, you know, it was a little people were laughing at it because, 
you know, the way it's phrased. I don't know. That's the key factor. I don't know what I don't know. So I'll learn what I need to know. Anyway, uh, the, I was confused because the guy's name, as it turns out, is Edward Durr, D-U-R-R. And of course, he's a Republican. So it's D-U-R-R-R. But <laughs> I'm looking at it and it's being tweeted around, you know, uh, uh, who, who's tweeting this, this around? I see this guy all the time. Lots of followers. I don't know what his deal is exactly, but he loves uh, the video clips. Asin, maybe A-C-Y-N. I don't know how he pronounces that. But anyway, lots of followers. I see his video clips all the time. He's tweeting it around and he's he's quoting the guy. And then saying, you know, but here's what here's what the guy is saying, except, you know, in print, it says Durr colon. And then the quote, I really don't know. That's the key factor. I don't know what I don't know. So I will learn what I need to know. And I was like, what? Why is he? And then I, I watched the clip and then they identify him here. Edward Durr, R, New Jersey Senate candidate. And I was like, oh, his name is Durr. I mean, that's unfortunate and all. And I would have had a good laugh at that, generally speaking. But I was like, that seems pretty judgmental, even for Ace in here. Durr, I really don't know. That's the key. Oh, oh, Mr. Durr is saying that. I'm so sorry, sir. I don't really have any, you know, basis on which to disrespect you here. But uh, that did make it sound a little strange. Anyway, so apologies to Edward Durr, R for that one and i guess we'll we'll check up on it and maybe through the magic of having this show be pre-taped i can go check now oh, i've destroyed all the magic uh that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go see where he stands on those results and i'll come right back and tell you and then because that'll take like 10 seconds i'll tell you something else after that okay hey presto i'm back i just checked um now again i can't remember what greg told us about whether or not that race was decided. But I guess it was. It must have been the case. The New York Times does, in fact, report Stephen Sweeney, New Jersey's Senate president, loses to Republican truck driver. And that's the way I remember the story being told. But uh, for some reason, I, 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 I got the idea in my head that it might not have been decided yet. But uh, the Times reports this, and I guess it was uh, posted and then updated late enough Close enough to the time that I'm recording this now to sound like it's 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 all over. Uh, Want to know more about the the race and the guy, Mr. Sweeney, the second most powerful lawmaker in New Jersey and a Democrat, lost his bid for re-election to Edward Durr, a driver for a furniture chain. I wonder if we can find out which one. For nearly a decade, Stephen M. Sweeney, the second most powerful lawmaker in New Jersey, seemed truly unassailable. I guess he's been assailed. The, uh, he boasted deep ties to the most feared political power broker in the state. Doesn't sound like a really great description. And unyielding support from the uninfluential building trade unions. Four years ago, the state teachers union spent more than $5 million to unseat him. He won by 18 points. That's interesting that they even tried that. I wonder what the deal was there. There's a link. Uh, I'm kind of curious. Let's Let's follow it. And uh, see what it says here. New Jersey's teachers union wages costly war against powerful Democrat. Uh, does it say why? Maybe in the opening things. Uh, let's see. High price campaign unfolding largely rural legislative district in the southwest corner of the state where the New Jersey Education Association, considered the state's most influential union, is engaged in a feud with Stephen Sweeney. Uh, it's a clash that on paper is perplexing. The Education Association leans dem Democratic. Um, let's see. The uh, opponent at the time was the chair of the Salem County Republican Party, a uh, supporter of Chris Christie, who was on their way out at that point, uh, and President Trump, who routinely, both routinely uh, you, uh, vilified by the union, but the dispute over pension benefits that dates back to 2011 has put the union on a mission to defeat Mr. Sweeney. Hmm. We won't get too far into that, but I thought that was, a, I don't know, worth checking into on uh, uh, background. Anyway, this year, 
Sweeney's challenger was Edward Durr, a truck driver for Raymore and Flanagan, a furniture chain. Hmm. Never, never heard of it, but I, I don't know a lot of furniture chains. Who had never before held office. His campaign video was shot on a smartphone. Very, very hip. People like that now. Yet Mr. Sweeney, the state Senate president and a Democrat, was ousted in a shocking political upset by Mr. Durr. I love that. A Republican as voters opted for a political unknown in a result that immediately rattled the political moorings of the state. Voters also nearly ousted Governor Philip D. Murphy. The governor narrowly won re-election over his Republican challenger. Uh, Never mind. Blah, blah, blah. You know all about that story. I want to get back to Sweeney uh, and and Durr. Sweeney and Durr. I'm going to make a great firm name. Anyway, It was Mr. Sweeney's loss that was perhaps best emblematic of the predicament facing Democrats in suburban and exurban communities. The Associated Press called the race on Thursday morning as Mr. Durr maintained a 2,298-vote lead over Mr. Sweeney with all precincts counted. Though Mr. Sweeney's district in the southwestern part of the state has never been deeply blue like the northeastern counties, It has reliably elected a Democrat since its creation in 1973, save for one year when the Democratic incumbent switched parties. Hmm. Mr. Sweeney held a vice grip on the district. They don't like him very much. Hmm. Maybe he's a jerk. I don't know. Uh, Largely composed of blue-collar suburbs just south of Camden and poorer rural areas thanks to the powerful allies and a decidedly moderate record playing up his background as an iron worker and a union leader. But as support for Democrats eroded in the suburbs and evaporated in rural areas in both New Jersey and Virginia, Mr. Sweeney found himself facing a surge in Republican voters and a loss in support from the working class backing he had so often relied on. Being a Democratic lawmaker during an era of coronavirus lockdowns, Mandates in schools and dysfunction in Washington was enough to erode what was once unshakable backing. In Gloucester County, uh, Catherine oh, uh, Biasello, 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 maybe, I don't know, uh, 70, I guess a voter, said she is a registered Democrat who voted for Mr. Durr because she is unhappy with the state's high tax rate and because. She disapproves of the state's closure of public schools during the pandemic. And probably didn't have any kids in the school, but whatever. Uh, she uh, lives in West Deptford and said Mr. Sweeney could have stepped up to oppose the school shutdowns, but did not. He could have influenced the governor, she said. Sweeney's loss amounts to a seismic restructuring of political power and influence, leaving a substantial vacuum in the state legislature. Sweeney had held the post of Senate president with the ability to set the legislative agenda for nearly 12 years. That is quite a while. In the Trump era, Republicans were seen as doomed to a permanent minority in New Jersey, as voters' deep contempt for the former president was strong enough to turn the long-held Republican suburbs blue. Democrats flipped four House seats in the 2018 midterm elections, But the surprising defeat of Mr. Sweeney, coupled with Mr. Murphy's slim margin of victory in unexpectedly tight races involving popular rising Democratic stars in the state like Vin Gopal, a state senator from Monmouth County, reveals a Republican Party that seems to be marching back to relevance. Hmm. Uh, I guess at this point we can probably stop. Although, oh, well, I was trying to hope, uh, hoping to find out... uh, other information about Mr. Durr. Yes. Uh, hmm. Uh, oh, well, here's one point here. Uh, Mr. Durr apparently lives in a house next door to his mother in southern New Jersey. Um, that's nice. Mr. Durr did not the same house. Mr. Durr told news outlets that he had spent $153 on his campaign. Well, but financial disclosure reports indicate he spent Roughly $2,200 on his race. Uh, Those two numbers are not the same. His meager campaign included an 80-second campaign video where he accentuated his working-class roots with an opening scene of his stepping down from his truck cab and ending with his riding away on a motorcycle. 
Indeed, when his victory was announced, Mr. Durr was on a shift driving his truck. How do you like that? His campaign, which largely consisted of his video lawn signs uh, uh, and door knocking, okay, projected more grievance than platforms, taking issue with the coronavirus policies of Mr. Murphy and claiming Mr. Sweeney, quote, sat by and watched. He also focused on the state's high cost of living. The Senate president has spent 20 years in Trenton, higher taxes, increasing debt, and a rising cost of living, Mr. Durr says in his video. Uh, I mean, he just says those things. I mean, he doesn't connect the two, but I guess you're supposed to do that yourself. Though he received little media attention, Mr. Durr conducted an interview in August with an online news outlet where he said he was angered he could not get a concealed carry permit in New Jersey and called Mr. Murphy arrogant. Oh, boy. I mean, he might be right, but I don't know. Uh... Anyway, the gun, of course. They made him king in March of 2020, Mr. Durr said with the, in the interview, referring to the emergency powers during the pandemic. And they crowned him in the June of uh, 2021. Not really sure why that would have been the case, but okay. Mr. Sweeney, in a statement released on Thursday, did not concede. Okay, <laughs> at least we'll have one of those going on. The results from Tuesday's election continue to come in. For instance, there were 12,000 ballots recently found in one county. Oh my, he sounds like someone I know. While I am currently trailing in the race, we want to make sure every vote is counted. Our voters deserve that, and we will wait for the final results. Uh, and I'm sure there are still some outstanding. Democrats, of course, still maintain single-party control over the entire state government, but Mr. Sweeney's loss nonetheless shocked the forces that have long controlled Trenton. Rarely did a governor's priority reach the floor without Mr. Sweeney's approval. And now we're back on Sweeney. Um, and uh, look, I'm here for the dir. <laughs> I admit it. Okay, well, anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. I uh, hope you did, too. And uh, now we can cast about for a couple other stories that I might be able to share with you before our top of the hour break comes up. Uh, let's see. Uh, any more uh, related stories? I should just scan uh, pocket here and see what else there is. Uh, well, no, I think we can probably switch gears after that. Um, well, there is one more election item that I'd like to bring to your attention. And I don't know whether I can really make it last until the break, but let's find out. Uh, but, you know, it's been a bit of an obsession of mine uh, trying to uh, clarify the record about Loudoun County. I spent some time on what we'll call yesterday's show talking about that fact that, yeah, you know, uh, Loudoun was, is still pretty blue and, uh, you know, elected Democrats across the board, even in the districts which were re intimately wrapped up in the, uh, the nationally publicized sexual assault case here in Loudoun County in the schools. Um, and anyway, I'm reminded, though, once again, of just how the election actually went and, and one other way of viewing it. And again, it doesn't change the fact that Glenn Youngkin appears to have been elected governor here, that doesn't switch things. Uh, and it doesn't change the fact that he was elected governor because, in large part, of the inroads he made in Loudoun County and places like it. That combined with the overwhelming uh, numbers that he posted in the extraordinarily red portions of the state, even, as Greg said, outperforming Trump himself in those Trump counties, uh, still in all, I think, you know, I'm not offering it to, to challenge the results or to say that the results aren't what they are. I'm offering it by way of changing what might be, if not your perception and perhaps the perception of people you run into online or in real life about Loudoun County and what Loudoun County is and isn't and what it's like. And I think it's all too easy to get confused about that and come away with the wrong impression. And uh, I live here and I don't feel good about that. Uh, this comes to my attention thanks to Julie Briskman, whose name you might recall. She is uh, now a member of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors, probably first introduced to you if you remember who she is as the woman who was riding her bike near the Trump golf course when Trump went tootling by in his limo and she gave him the finger and then got fired for it. 
there you go. That's the whole background. Uh, there's more, of course. But she was tweeting about this uh, yesterday and I think made a good point and connected to the tweets from the Loudon Dems Twitter feed that make the point even uh, more uh, explicit. She's saying, as my Republican Board of Supervisors colleagues said at our meeting last night, an 11 percent deficit is not a win for the GOP in Loudoun County. That is to say, there was this big swing among uh, voters who might have been Biden turned Yunkin voters. And it was a significant portion of the votes cast in the district. And of course, uh, McAuliffe got what about 55% of the vote, whereas uh, Biden had gotten over 60% of the votes, over 61% of the vote. And so, oh, well, this tremendous underperformance. Although there was other information that compared maybe more apples to apples, uh, McAuliffe versus how he himself did in 2013. And he outperformed his 2013 performance. Anyway, she goes on to say that, uh, well, uh, links to the Loudon Dems who point out that even with this giant swing and even with these uh, enormous numbers of people swinging over to Yunkin and making a big national issue out of it, uh, it's still a democratic place. Even an 11% swing doesn't undo the fact that Loudon is democratic. They put it this way. This election was so deeply important for us, for our neighbors, and for our communities. Our progress comes not in a straight line, but in a jagged path. As we zig and zag along that path, Loudon Democrats delivered up and down the ballot. Together, they continued, together, we held every House of Delegates seat in Loudoun. Together, we delivered a double-digit county victory for our statewide candidates. Together, we won seven of eight magisterial districts. Together, we delivered the most votes to a statewide Democratic ticket in county history. A lot of things went pretty well for Democrats in Loudoun County, and it stayed pretty Democratic. Just remember that. Okay, welcome back now to the Cake Going to Morning Show here on Networks Radio. All right, ah, just checking in. I thought uh, I would uh, throw that in there and uh, I think pretty important, but only, you know, because I, I'm feeling, I guess, feeling defensive about things. Maybe people aren't saying such awful, awful things about us after all, uh, at least not anymore. I hope not, but uh, I just, uh, you know, I think that's pretty important and uh and also a good point, something that uh, not to be overlooked uh, in, in terms of trying to figure out, well, how do you approach strategy now if you've outperformed yourself and outperformed Democrats in general? Where do you go from here if you're going to win statewide? That's a pretty that's actually a pretty tough question. And I'm not sure uh, what the answer is just yet. OK, Uh Let's see. I'm thinking now that uh, where did I find this? I think did I retweet the uh, story about? I think so about Democratic performance in the last election. I'm pretty sure that I did. And if I scroll back a little bit, I'll probably find it. Here we are. Uh, it's playing off of someone else's tweet here. The original tweet here is from Ryan Brune who uh, apparently is, uh, well, a uh, described here in Twitter as politics and mapping fanatic, economics and math graduate, attempting nonpartisan analysis, uh, among other things. And uh, let's see, particularly interested in Ohio, Georgia and Virginia. So this falls in his wheelhouse. And he says this, providing a map. Virginia Democrats had something of a turnout disaster on Tuesday, he says. Relatively speaking, Democrats did not turn out nearly as many voters as they did four years ago in many critical Democratic strongholds. That's his claim. And he's got a map that appears to prove it in his view, except that that conclusion is uh, disputed by Aaron Fritschner, uh, 
communications chief for Congressman Don Beyer. And uh, let's see, has also worked for Jennifer Wexton along the way, uh, my own representative, and Deborah Ross in North Carolina. Uh, at any rate, he's uh, got this to say. Uh, this His view of what Ryan Brune and how Ryan Brune puts it. This is like saying a sprinter who sets a personal record ran a bad race for them because another sprinter set an even better personal record in that race. Dem turnout in Northern Virginia and in most of the purple places on Ryan's map, there's, you know, the color codes that he uses, there's a purple uh, for that that uh, got increased uh, turnout there. Uh, at any rate, Democrats uh, did not, oh, uh, where were we? Um, Democrat turnout in Northern Virginia, Aaron says, and in most of the purple places on the map, saw absolutely massive increases in 2017 and just went up again. So it's a pretty good point in that, uh, well, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's problematic that uh, you say that Democrats had a turnout disaster. They broke their turnout records in most cases. So, yeah, uh, it's just that, again, as has been pointed out, it's just it just went better for Republicans, which then brings us back to what I was saying to Armando in our earlier show. And I found the tweet that went along with it. It was from uh, Sam Levine, voting rights reporter for The Guardian U.S., formerly of HuffPost. I told you we're going to turn into a HuffPost show today. Uh, saying it's worth noting that Virginia Dems repealed voter ID, enacted automatic voter registration, enacted no excuse mail-in voting, extended the ballot receipt deadline past election day, used executive action to get around the lifetime ban for people with felonies, and as a result, this was the idea, turnout increased from 2017. But not only did turnout increase from 2017, but it's also worth pointing out, turnout increased and the Republicans won. He points out that it would be then worth remembering all of this next time proposals to make it easier to vote are framed by Republicans as a way of helping Democrats win elections. Ah, yeah, that's pretty interesting because right now, right now in the U.S. Senate, Democrats are offering to do the same on a national level. And Republicans are refusing to let them do it. We're refusing to even let them begin debate on doing it, much less get to a vote on whether or not to do it on the grounds that it's all just a partisan sham. And they don't really care, Democrats, about making it easier for more people to vote and participate in democracy. What they really want is the partisan advantage that comes from doing this, except that the partisan advantage has not manifested. Any advantage that has manifested so far here in New Jersey has been on behalf of Republicans. Why are Republicans so dead set against allowing Democrats to make it possible for more people to vote so that Republicans end up with the benefit of that and winning more races. Why? I'm not sure. It seems to me that if Democrats are offering you this chance to increase Republican turnout, you ought to take it. You ought not to filibuster it. Maybe we shouldn't be so upset that they are, but maybe we're just actually dedicated to the idea that more people should be allowed to voice their opinion and actually vote. And if more people were able to voice their opinion, I mean, look, I disagree vehemently with what the Republicans are trying to do, and especially the more deplorable MAGA-type Republicans. But I will say this. If they keep uh, leaning on the excuse that they're all so frustrated that they drop out of politics, but then when they get back into politics, they're this loopy about it, and they'll even try to sack the Capitol to make their point, I think I'd like to give them some other release valves along the way. Maybe get them to learn that voting might be better than beating people up or attacking the Capitol. I don't know. But also, I'd like to win some of these races, I must say. Anyway, I just thought that was perhaps of some interest to you, and may maybe you'd like to know about that. Hmm. Okay, let's see. I have a couple other 
uh, items to share with you. And uh, before I started in on this, I had some idea of, of where I was going to begin. Ah, yes, remember that I was going to tell you a little bit about um, what Ron DeSantis is up to down in Florida. Let's do a bit of a Florida show at this point. Um, and I had something else. Where did I see? Uh, it was right before, as I was scrolling, looking for Sam's uh, tweet here that I just shared. Uh, gosh, there was something else that, okay. oh yeah, right. I think uh, if I scroll down a little bit, I'll find it. But something I think from Greg Sargent. Ah, yeah, there it is. But having to do with DeSantis. Uh, did I park this? I bet I did park it in. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Uh, uh, let me open up the article. Greg Sargent was tweeting and pointing to something from Steve Bannon. And uh, yeah, it must be, I bet it's in the article. So rather than let Greg Sargent spoil the point for Steve, we'll read this bit. Um, controversy grows over Florida silencing professors at odds with DeSantis. The list of professors blocked from testifying in cases related to Governor Ron DeSantis' policies keeps growing. I don't know whether it's gone beyond the fourth or not, but a good point is allegedly made in this piece by Steve Bannon after Florida Republicans created wildly unnecessary new voting restrictions, even though it appears that they benefit from removing those restrictions, legal fights soon followed. Under normal circumstances, we'd expect to see some of the state's leading scholars offering expert testimony, explaining in detail the effects of the new state statutes. As we were reminded last week, Florida's circumstances aren't normal at all. The University of Florida blocked three political scientists from testifying. The school said there was a conflict. The university is a public institution and part of the state government. Since the lawsuit is challenging a state law signed by Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, the professors, according to their employer, had to remain neutral. In effect, the school concluded that the University of Florida professors are somehow an extension of the DeSantis administration. This week, the burgeoning controversy got a little worse. The New York Times reported, quote, a decision by the University of Florida to bar three professors from testifying in a lawsuit against the administration of Governor Ron DeSantis has ballooned into a political and public relations firestorm, one that could grow as other professors consider whether to step forward with stories of university pressure. Since Friday, when the university's decision was disclosed in a federal court filing, five more professors have offered accounts of being barred from testifying or ordered to omit mention of their university positions in court statements. So that is an increase in the number. Among those affected is pediatrician Jeffrey Goldhagen. We, this was the, uh, the fourth that was revealed earlier, right? The governor's policy against mask protections in schools is also facing a legal fight, and Goldhagen was prepared to offer expert testimony. The University of Florida wouldn't allow this either. It's creating an environment which is putting intolerable pressure on universities and other institutions as well to comply with the political policies of this administration for sure, the physician told the Times. I don't think there's any question about that. And that gets to what makes this story so interesting. Is Florida's flagship university, which used to have very different policies in this area, trying to comply with DeSantis' political agenda? Has anyone pressured the university to do so? The Washington Post's Greg Sargent added, and now I see why Greg Sargent was so excited about sending around this article. He's quoted in it. Added what? Quote, one rather important thing that has changed since the university allowed such testimony is that DeSantis is now the governor. Well, Armando told us that, right? DeSantis has major allies on the university's board of trustees, one of whom is both a major GOP donor and top DeSantis advisor. What's unclear is whether they are behind this decision. Let's also not forget that as recently as June, the Republican governor, a former right, far right member of Congress, launched an initiative that said uh, an initiative he said was intended to prevent the, quote, indoctrination of students 
at Florida universities. The plan included mandatory surveys of university students, faculty, and staff about their political beliefs. I had forgotten about that. This is the point that Greg thought, Greg Sargent thought was so good in this Steve Bannon article. And it's a, it's a good pull, good memory here. According to a report in the Tampa Bay Times, DeSantis and the bill's legislative sponsor said state colleges and universities could face budget cuts depending on the result. In other words, we're already dealing with a gubernatorial administration that has no use for academic freedom. The latest revelations make matters considerably worse. Make matters, because we're talking about education. Got to get the, the, the language right. The Chronicle of Higher Education reported that the University of Florida's accreditor, as Armando told us, plans to investigate the questions surrounding professors who've been blocked from testifying. Democratic lawmakers from the Sunshine State have also taken an interest and in a little update at the end here, DeSantis's office has extended tacit support for the university's decision through the governor's, uh, though, sorry, though the governor's team has also denied any involvement in what's transpired. So they just gave him a little pat on the head, uh, but we won't say why. It's just, we just thought a good decision by these guys. All right. Just saying. Uh, there's another DeSantis story. I mentioned it in what was effectively yesterday's show, but didn't actually read you the story. I just thought it was goofy headline, but now we can actually get to it. And because I'm reading it on the same day, it kind of sort of counts like I got to it. From Politico, remember the story with which we opened when reading Bill's tweet about DeSantis calling for new Florida police force to go after election crimes, like the one where he uses the power of the governor's office to uh, reshape the political landscape by forbidding professors to speak, for instance. This uh, report by Gary Finout, is that how he would pronounce it? It's spelled like fine out. That's a fine out you've made there, Mr. First Baseman. F-I-N-E-O-U-T. If it's pronounced some other way, I have no guess about it. Dateline, Tallahassee. Beep, 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 beep. All right. Anyway, Governor Ron DeSantis vowed on Wednesday to create a fully staffed statewide law enforcement office whose sole job would be to crack down on election crimes, despite previously praising Florida's smooth 2020 elections and rebuffing calls by members of his own party for an audit. DeSantis, who is running for re-election and is considered a potential 2024 presidential contender because he's willing to say dopey things, uh, he's going to be defeated by Mr. Durr from New Jersey, possibly, is also pressing state lawmakers to increase the criminal penalty for violating new restrictions on collecting mail-in ballots. He also wants to enact a tight new 100-day deadline on when local election officials must scrub their voter rolls for those who died, moved, or have been convicted of a felony. The new law enforcement office will cost nearly $6 million, according to a document obtained by Politico. And it's just going to be one guy, the $6 million man. Steve Austin, a man barely informed. <laughs> He's going to be doing all the investigating. I guarantee you this, remember this part, the first person that gets caught, no one is going to want to do it again after that, said DeSantis at a West Palm Beach event, billed as a press conference, but featured which featured, I guess, dozens of DeSantis supporters who loudly applauded the governor. So it is a press conference, just with actors. At one point, the crowd cheered, oh, you know it, let's go, Brandon, a conservative rallying cry against President Joe Biden. Uh, so funny. The go Although, again, best comment about that, uh, let's go, Brandon, has, uh, again, the comedians coming through, calling uh, the uh, folks who would say such things as let's go, Brandon, the LGB community, which I think is funny, and they probably won't. The governor also says he wants the GOP-controlled legislature to put additional restrictions on the use of drop boxes, because drop box crime, obviously. I don't even think we should have drop boxes, said DeSantis, even though he signed the bill two years ago that first authorized their use in the state. I hate myself, he said. That I believe. 
The Republican governor's push comes just months after he successfully got state legislators to enact a controversial new voting law that adds new restrictions on the collection of mail-in ballots, including a clampdown on when and where drop boxes could be located, which I also don't think should exist. I don't know. It also comes as some Republicans in the state, echoing former President Donald Trump's baseless election fraud claims, are pushing for an audit of the 2020 election over DeSantis's objections. And now I'm saying, I object to my objection as well. I don't know. That new election law has drawn multiple federal lawsuits from civil rights and voting rights groups who contend those restrictions unfairly discriminate against elderly voters, voters with disabilities, and minority voters. These additional proposals could throw another hot-button issue into an upcoming regular session where Florida legislators will be working on redistricting abortion restrictions, of course, because there's a session, and another battle with tech companies over data privacy. The session starts in January. Democrats, who have little power to stop the changes, quickly condemned the governor's plans. State Representative Anna... Eskimani, an Orlando Democrat, said on Twitter, more attacks on voting coming to Florida. Just like in 2020, we had elections last night in our state with no issues. Why does our governor keep creating partisan chaos? Why can't we just focus on problems like housing, hunger, taxes, our environment and public transportation? And kitchen tables, presumably. One of the biggest changes contained in the new law was a two ballot limit on how many mail-in ballots someone could gather and turn in on behalf of the elderly or sick and disabled voters, even though there is an exception for immediate family members. This ban on, quote, ballot harvesting is a misdemeanor that DeSantis wants increased to a felony. DeSantis also said that many election, local election offices and local prosecutors either do not want to or lack the expertise to investigate election crimes. In late September, the governor asked Florida Secretary of State Laurel Lee to investigate whether Facebook interfered with the 2020 election, even though her offices do not have any investigators. Her office does not have any investigators. Under the governor's proposal, Florida would create an Office of Election Crimes and Security. Uh, That sounds like they're going to perpetrate them, but okay. That would have sworn law officers, uh, law enforcement agents, as well as other investigators who aren't sworn, I guess. I don't swear to do anything right. I'm just going to investigate. To probe voter fraud and other election law violations, a three-page outline obtained by Politico says the governor's election police force would cost $5.7 $5.7 million in the first year and have 52 employees, including 20 sworn law officers, uh, law enforcement agents who would be based in Tallahassee and five field offices. The breakdown of the governor's proposal also called for uniform reporting of felony convictions to election supervisors, banning cities from using ranked voting. <laughs> which is already banned for the state. So let's ban it twice. And maybe that means it's unbanned and a new deadline for determining voter eligibility. Local supervisors are already required to report to the state twice a year on how many voters they have removed in the previous six months. Leon County supervisor of elections, Mark early said in an email that quote, there is not much new there that we don't already do. So not a great use of your time, but five point seven more million more dollars anyway. Early said he already turns over well documented election law violations to state law enforcement, and not much ever happens for various reasons. He added he already follows existing deadlines in state and federal law on scrubbing voter rolls, and that the governor's proposal sounds like what we already do. So maybe it's not so bad, except for wasting six million bucks on cops. DeSantis's push for a second round of election law changes comes even though the governor boasted a year ago that the state had finally, quote, vanquished the ghost of the 2000 presidential election recount that subjected the state to international ridicule. But an ever louder chorus of Republicans have called for a, quote, forensic audit and hand recount of Florida's election, even though Trump easily won the state over Joe Biden. 
Trump has not commented directly on Florida, but he has pushed for audits across the country, including in Texas, Wisconsin, and Arizona. This past weekend, longtime Trump ally and Florida resident Roger Stone suggested that he may run against DeSantis as a libertarian candidate if he did not order an audit. Ah, so yeah, I did see originally when this was being tweeted around that it was perhaps the case that this threat from Roger Stone was maybe what motivated him to do this otherwise pretty stupid and useless thing. But that wasn't the threat. The threat was that he would run against him unless he came out behind an audit. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that's really going to satisfy the Roger Stone or not, but uh, well, I guess with him now being pardoned, he sh guy should be in jail, but instead he's been pardoned and now he's going to threaten to run for governor. And uh, we'll see. I had mentioned that I had seen this thing tweeted around with uh, some mention of that. And, and I think, if I remember correctly, yeah, it was Nikki Freed who is herself set to run against uh, DeSantis for governor next time around. She's the Florida Agriculture Commissioner pointing this out, saying, uh, please don't be fooled. It's another political stunt. Why? It's happening because, I guess, Roger Stone last week threatened to run against him if he didn't audit 2020. So DeSantis calls for a new Florida police force to go after election crimes, and I guess he thinks that does the trick for him. We'll see. Uh, Roger Stone might be a pretty lazy guy and just not bother. But running for governor as a libertarian in Florida it probably doesn't require that much of a guy like him. So uh, don't count him out. Just don't count him governor either. All right. Well, I'll change gears for a second. I got about three minutes or so before we uh, play out for the break. And I've got a couple of short-ish stories sent to me. I mentioned them the other day. Sent to me by alert listener Dave R. Well, I didn't find him that way. That's uh, the easiest way to do it. That's what it says on the email. And, uh, all right, well, he sent me these two stories, one of which looks interesting. Why am I not doing this? Oh, I see. He's in trouble for doing this. North Texas radio host gets three life prison terms for targeting listeners in scheme. Hmm. I thought, hmm, a scheme, a radio host. I could do this, but three life sentences in Texas, huh? A Texas radio host was sentenced to three life prison sentences on Monday for a Ponzi scheme, see, you can't do those, in which he bilked elderly listeners out of millions of dollars. Are we all elderly here? I'm not certain I can get away with this. All right, well, this keeps me out. William Neal, or Doc Gallagher, also got a 30-year prison sentence from State District Judge Elizabeth Beach for his August guilty pleas. The sentences are to be served concurrently, Sentencing came after more than a dozen senior victims testified during a three-hour court hearing about losing anywhere from $50,000 to $600,000. That's I definitely, that's how I can't get involved in something like this. Anybody got fifty or $600,000 to spare? Wow. Uh, why did they lose it? They invested it in the Gallagher Financial Group. I guess he did a financial show. Some said they had to sell their homes, borrow money from their children, or take part-time jobs to supplement their Social Security benefits. What made them think they were investors? I don't know. I guess he told them they would get guaranteed returns. Doc Gallagher is one of the worst offenders I have seen, said Lori Varnell, chief of the Tarrant County District Attorney's Elder Financial Fraud Team. See, that's something you need a real police force for, not election crime. Gallagher, himself 80 years old, and his Gallagher Financial Group advertised on Christian radio, of course, with the tagline, see you in church on Sunday, which is why they all trusted him, I'm sure. He promoted his investment business in books such as Jesus Christ Money Master, that seems incompatible, and on Christian radio broadcasts. Gallagher has been behind bars since his March 2019 arrest on similar charges filed in Dallas County. In 2020, he pleaded guilty to those charges and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. He was indicted in Tarrant County in August of 2019. He ruthlessly stole from his clients who trusted him for almost a decade. 
which I guess is about as far as they could throw him, perhaps. He amassed $32 million in losses to all of his clients and exploited many elderly individuals. It says elder individuals, but I'll change it myself. He worked his way around churches, praying, <laughs> P-R-E-Y, praying on people who believed he was a Christian, Varnell said in a statement. I can't prove that he's not, but it doesn't sound like a very good one. Well, I'll save the other story, perhaps, for another tight spot. Maybe it'll come up in the next segment. I don't know. At any rate, thanks to Dave for forwarding that one. Uh, answered my own question. I will not be bilking any of you out of that much money. I can pretty much promise you that. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Speaking of bilking you all out of money, <laughs> I guess, I try not to bilk anybody, but uh, we're, we're thanking someone who I'm, uh, I guess, bilking out of just a little more money, a, a uh, current Patreon patron who has boosted their pledge, thanks to Andre Kimball for allowing me to bilk him out of uh, six or seven hundred thousand dollars at a time. I wish. Don't you wish you had that kind of money to get bilked out of? Everybody go and sell your homes and borrow money from your children. And uh, send it to me. Uh, hmm. I don't think that's illegal. If I just ask you to do that and you do it, is that okay? If I, if I promise you investment returns, I think I'm in trouble. I doubt I'm going to be able to return any of that money to you. Uh, but if you want to send it to me, by all means, please do. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who does. I sure hope you don't feel bilked out of it. I do have this other article here from Dave. Uh, this also not usually... Uh, something we stop and spend time on, which makes it, I guess, all the more important that I stop and spend time on it now that Dave has suggested it. I take this as a suggestion that, that we ought to be spending time on this. And, uh, of course, important, and I recognize that it will be interesting to many of you, and not a source of news that I usually uh, get to include in the show, from Bolivia, the Bolivian president, uh, although he isn't in Bolivia now, He's in Glasgow, I guess, at the COP26. Do they say COP26 or COP26? Um, and in Common Dreams here, uh, Dave spots this article that he thought was interesting. And I do too. Bolivian president warns carbon colonialism. I don't know if I'm even familiar. I could take a guess at what that is, but I better get up to speed on it. He warns that carbon colonialism won't solve the climate crisis. It's not a tongue twister. It's alliterative, but uh, okay. The solution, says Luis Arce at COP, or COP26. Luis Arce is the man we're speaking of, Bolivian president. Luis Arce is to change the model of civilization uh -oh, and move towards an alternative model to capitalism, the concept of living well together in harmony with Mother Earth. I, I think I can sell that in Loudoun County if I work hard at it, there's plenty of environmentalists here, more so than our non-environmentalists, I keep reminding you. Brett Wilkins wrote the piece at Common Dreams. Let's figure out what's going on here. While rich country leaders pushed what critics called false capitalist fixes to the climate crisis during Monday's sessions of the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, Scotland, Bolivia's socialist president warned that true solutions to the planetary emergency require moving beyond capitalism to an alternative model that centers living together in harmony with Mother Earth. We view with frustration 
the ending, or rather the enduring, I wish it was ending, enduring global framework that hasn't finished defining a global solution to the climate crisis, which has become the principal problem we must face in defense of humanity and the life of Mother Earth, Bolivian President Luis Arce said in his address to the UN conference, also called COP26 or COP26, on Monday, we perceive that developed countries are simply buying time without any sense of responsibility for humanity. Mm, probably should take that responsibility. Echoing concerns voiced by indigenous activists, Arce said that developed countries are promoting a new world recolonization process. Oh, oh did not intend that. Uh, that we can call the new carbon colonialism because they are trying to impose their own rules of the game in the climate negotiations to continue feeding the new green capitalist system while pushing developing nations to accept these rules of the game without any other options. Okay, that's a complaint I've heard before and, and understand. The solution to the climate crisis is not going to be achieved with more green capitalism and more global carbon markets, stressed Arce. And I think that's all we've got at this point uh, from our side, uh, at least officially speaking. Who uh, Arce, who is also an economist on top of all this, by the way, the solution is to change the model of civilization and move toward an alternative model to capitalism, the concept of living well together in harmony with Mother Earth. This comes up a lot. The president said... and. <clears throat> not our president, th their president, Arce, said that if the nations of the global north truly want to be leaders in tackling the climate emergency, they must reduce emissions within the framework of the Paris Climate Agreement, okay, promote an equitable distribution of atmospheric space, and provide financial and other resources for developing nations. If the current generations do not solve the climate crisis, there will be a very heavy burden and impossible, impossible one, I assume, to solve for the generations to come, he warned. A 2009 Oxfam report predicted Bolivia would suffer acute food and water insecurity, disappearing glaciers, more frequent and severe natural disasters, increased mosquito-borne diseases, and more forest fires as a result of human-driven climate change. Last December, the group issued a follow-up report which confirmed many of the earlier predictions, including a water crisis driven by glacier melt. By the way, the initial crisis from that is too much water, and then later, not enough. But in addition to all of this, uh, we mentioned mosquito-borne disease, dengue fever outbreaks, and historic forest fires. So... Bleak outlook for Bolivia. You can understand, of course, why he's uh, warning of that then. You know, I should have grabbed, um, and I wonder if I can go on to Twitter and uh, search it out a little bit. But I've seen a lot of chatter on Twitter about uh, the performance at the conference of the president, president or prime minister of Barbados. Uh, which has been, you know, on my radar, mostly as um, having current difficulties with um, uh, with with COVID and showing up uh, in the top ten lists and just having you know overall struggle uh, with, with the disease. But she's apparently been a really outspoken voice and a big deal at the COP26. I wish I knew if it was COP or COP26. I don't, I don't like to sound like I have no idea what's going on there, but I really do have no idea what's going on there. As a matter of fact, anyway, I just wanted to search it out. And like I said, I've seen her picture a couple of times in a lot of headlines about it. And uh, lo and behold, it turns out that there's a write-up about it from our good friend, Denise Oliver Velez over at Daily Coast. And good, this way we can catch up and we can catch up with somebody that we know, you know, has some idea of what they're talking about uh, in, in anything at all. And particularly um, in, in, well, as she titles this thing, in Caribbean matters. Caribbean matters, Barbados's 
Mia Motley, it's M-O-T-T-L-E-Y, I hope I've got that right, stuns the world again. So let's find out about the first time if we can. This time at COP26. Denise writing this, uh, uh, well, just, you know, yesterday. Wink, wink. So hot and fresh, right from the oven. After her forceful presentation at the United Nations on September 24th, previously covered in Caribbean Matters, so we can go back and look at that, Barbados's Prime Minister Mia Motley has made global and social media headlines again. This time, it's for the fiery speech she delivered at the opening session of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, also known as COP26, in Glasgow, on November 1st. I'm going to click through to see um, what was up last time her name was called. Denise writing again on on uh, what she was up to back on October 7th. Prime Minister, there we go, not President, but Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados is a force to be reckoned with. I knew I had seen her name called earlier, and it wasn't just for this conference. I'll look back on that. And uh, just see what's up. Anyway, uh, focusing on the conference, because that's where we started. Motley represents, of course, a small Caribbean island country with a population of approximately 288,300. A a Caribbean island with a low population right now falls in the sweet spot of where COVID just loves to settle. And, uh, well, in terms of giving people a really bad look in terms of their infections, per million residents small populations the impact is gigantic only a few you know few people get it and you have a huge chunk of the population sick so you start rocketing to the top of the charts even if it's really not that much worse than other places anyway one of the oldest caribbean colonies of great britain barbados will soon be a nation without queen elizabeth as head of state effective november 30th I like to keep an eye on those things anyway Given the global crisis of climate change and the particular perils facing citizens of island nations, as well as other smaller countries with limited resources that are populated by, mostly, people of color, it seems fitting that a black woman is well on her way to becoming an international face and voice for those people who have been exploited for centuries by colonial powers. Now, While many of us have been pushing back against the negatives of social media giants, it's undeniable that only a few short years ago, the general public would never have been exposed to the voice of someone like Prime Minister Motley. Most Americans' knowledge of Barbados is limited to its existence as a Caribbean vacation location. Probably true. Cool flag as well, you know, in case you're into that stuff. Additionally, Few international speeches, unless given by leaders of European nations or Russia, make U.S. headlines. One Caribbean nation that is the exception to this rule is Cuba, of course. Uh, Yet, thanks to Twitter and Facebook, Motley has captured the attention of people beyond those individuals who are immersed in global politics or Caribbean studies. In case you missed it, here is her speech in full. It's uh, <clears throat> displayed below. And do they have the same green marble backdrop at COP26 as they do at the General Assembly in New York? I don't, it sort of looks like to me. Well, anyway, the full transcript is worth a read. And, well, it's rather lengthy, but uh, you know what? It's actually kind of manageable. I'm, now I'm interested in seeing what she had going on here. Uh, Well, let's see. She starts out with the greeting, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. The pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet. But we now find three gaps. I'm going to read just a little bit of here and let's save the uh, actual delivery for her, but give you an idea of what's going on. On mitigation Climate Pledges, or NDCs. Without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees, and with more, we are still likely to get to 2 degrees. I guess uh, average temperatures, right? You, The environmentalists, and I think everybody else has some inkling of what's going on here. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed, 
and this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. That's a good point. On finance, we are $20 billion short of the $100 billion, and this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%, not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed, given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured in my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. If Glasgow is to deliver on the promises of Paris, it must close these three gaps. Just a little more, please. Uh, So I ask to you, what must we say to our people living on the front line in the Caribbean, in Africa, Latin America, in the Pacific, when both ambition and, regrettably, some of the needed faces at Glasgow are not present. What excuse should we give for the failure in the words of that Caribbean icon, Eddie Grant? I wouldn't have guessed that he'd be quoted. Will they mourn us on the front line? When will we, as world leaders across the world, address the pressing issues that are truly causing our people angst and worry whether it is climate or whether it is vaccines. Now I wish I was actually just playing the audio from this. Maybe I can rig that up just to see if I could. I'd I'd like to see what kind of accent she's got going on. I think that would be very pleasant to hear. Uh, Let's see if we can play a little bit of the video uh, this way. And then we'll get on to Denise's further analysis of the the speech and the story. It's going to take me a minute to... Click through and get it all set up. Come on now. Here we go. Scrolling down. Just just, just curious to hear the voice. Oh, got to get this out of the way. Hey, this is becoming annoying. Why can't I get this pop-up out of the way? <laughs> okay. Thanks, Daily Coast. Too many pop-ups. Well, just let me roll a little bit of this. Your Royal screen. Highness, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, the pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to... That is something, that's a very interesting accent. It's not all that heavy, but uh, I like the voice. I love the accent. I don't don't want to take away from the the seriousness of the content, but I just was curious about what the Barbados accent was like. Okay, and I don't know whether hers is typical or not, but uh, back to Denise's commentary on it. In Motley's speech to the United Nations in September, uh, many headlines zoomed in on the fact that she quoted reggae icon Bob Marley. So this is a habit of hers. Oh, and by the way, yeah, I guess the shot of her, the picture illustrating the video really was, it must have been at the General Assembly. And maybe that's where she made headlines back in uh, early October because now she's against the blue backdrop of the COP26 conference. All right, so uh, this is not the first time she has quoted reggae icons in her speeches. In her COP26 speech, Motley referenced Living on the Front Line, a 1979 reggae hit by Eddie Grant, a Guyanese British singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist who is currently suing Donald Trump for copyright violation. Hey, can't ask for much more than that. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion, Denise writes, that Motley may have referenced Grant's music in her speech to throw some shade on this particular situation, which has been covered in both Caribbean and U.S. media. Climate change is clearly at the top of her agenda, both globally and back home. The Jamaica Observer reported on her remarks at a handover ceremony of the RSS Maritime Security Strategy Project on October 25th. The paper noted that she warned Caribbean nations that they must, quote, prepare for the possibility of a climate change event that could cause mass migration and displacement in the region. That's got to be a top concern for them as island nations. Motley is also known for her cool and competent, her cool and competence. There we are in interviews with the media, most recently in this interaction with a BBC interviewer about civil rights and members of the LGBTQ community. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I, I, I refer you to that. I don't know how long is that, uh, exchange. If it's short, maybe we'll play it. I mean, I didn't think I was going down this tangent, but 
Sounds pretty interesting. And now she's got me curious. How long is this going to take if I click through? Country. One last uh, okay. issue before I let you go. You've also said that you'll hold a referendum on gay marriage. For that next generation, should they be allowed to be gay in Barbados? So? Should people in Barbados wow. be allowed to be gay, to be homosexual? Is that a question you would ask the United Kingdom? Well, we have laws on gay marriage, and you're having a referendum on gay marriage, so it is pertinent. I think that that is the most inappropriate question as to whether persons should be allowed to be gay. I think the question is, should we discriminate against people because they're gay? And we will not. And we're absolutely clear that Barbados became the first black slave society and a country that has known what it is to discriminate against citizens for centuries cannot in today's world be discriminating against any human being for any reason whatsoever. Ow. Wow. I'm gonna, I'll stop it there. It's uh, I've probably already violated copyright. It's a BBC interview, so credit to BBC World News for that one. Uh, yeah, well, uh, is everything you could ask for in an answer, and you could very easily... Uh, lose your concentration she almost did she was just astonished that she was asked she'd be allowed to be gay that's the only answer you can give to a question like that wow okay well anyway thanks for highlighting that denise i appreciate uh, your calling that one out that heading down the tangents you didn't think you were going to go down some of the most interesting stuff we discover on this show i'm going to bring us back at this point, to uh, things that are, well, more in keeping with the, the usual features of the show. And uh, let's see, we'll run one more. Are we going to have time for this one? Let's call this up. I thought this was of some interest about uh, Tate Reeves down in Mississippi suing the Biden administration over vaccine mandates to, quote, Push back on federal tyranny. You know this is going to be uh, somewhat interesting. He, I don't think he can hold his own in this forum. This is a piece from the Mississippi Free Press. Ashton Pittman, the name of the writer, tweeting this around the other day and uh, makes a great counter to what Reeves is offering here. Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves is ordering state agencies to support an upcoming lawsuit. <laughs> no testimony allowed, I guess, from people at Mississippi State Universities, uh, to support an upcoming lawsuit aimed at undoing President Joe Biden's federal COVID-19 vaccine mandates. A lawsuit could come by week's end, he said on Tuesday. Joe Biden's vaccine mandates are one of the most shocking attacks on personal liberty we have seen in this country during my lifetime. Reeves said in a social media post, so you know this isn't going to go well. I am a strong supporter of the COVID vaccines. Don't tar me with that. And commend the Trump administration's efforts to develop it. That's how we can excuse this. The federal mandates, however, threaten every Mississippian's individual liberties. They are nothing short of tyranny. And mind you, uh, this is all happening in the context of about one in every 295 residents of Mississippi already is dead from COVID. They're well beyond the one in 300 mark and continuing to whittle those numbers down. That is to say, the numbers of Mississippians in existence. Anyway, Biden's vaccine mandate includes employees at institutions in the state that have federal contracts or receive federal grants, such as universities and businesses with more than 100 employees. On October 25th, the Mississippi Institutions of Higher Learning Board of Trustees ordered all eight universities in the state to mandate vaccines for employees and staff under Biden's guidelines. The best path our founders provided states to push back on federal tyranny is through the courts, Reeves said Tuesday. That's a relief because that's not usually the... the uh, avenue that people complaining about tyranny talk about using. We are working closely with our attorney general's office. I expect that we will have a lawsuit filed against the Biden administration by the end of the week, which is today, to stop this ridiculous overreach. I've instructed every branch of government that I control to work in support of this suit and in this cause. Uh, how many branches of this government does he control? The answer to that is one. The executive branch. I mean, 
What other branch does he think he controls? Maybe Republicans control another branch, and maybe that's what he thinks. And I am the state. I control all branches. All right. Biden's federal vaccine mandates do include several exemptions, including for medical reasons, disability, and sincerely held religious beliefs about vaccines. Our laws guarantee you religious freedom, and the federal government cannot force or threaten you to make a decision that may jeopardize your personal health, said Reeves, whose own state, uh, whose own state's childhood vaccine mandates, that is Mississippi's, for other diseases are among the strictest in the nation and do not allow religious or other non-medical exemptions. How do you like that? A little bit of hypocrisy. But wait, there's more. The governor has not always been a vocal opponent of vaccine mandates or health mandates. As lieutenant governor and Mississippi Senate president in 2015, Reeves presided over the unanimous passage of a bill to incarcerate tuberculosis patients who refuse treatment. How do you like that? The same bill failed in the Mississippi House by a 40 to 70 vote. Meanwhile, numerous bills aimed at either repealing Mississippi's childhood vaccine mandates or Adding religious exemptions died without a vote during Reeves' time as Senate president. What a great idea that was then. But now, I hate Joe Biden, so here we go. When the Mississippi governor first described Biden's mandates as tyranny in September, the president publicly denounced the remarks. In Mississippi, children are required to be vaccinated against measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, hepatitis B, polio, tetanus, and more. These are state requirements. But in the midst of a pandemic that has already taken over 660,000 lives, and it's many more now, I propose a requirement for COVID vaccines, and the governor of that state calls it, quote, a tyrannical type move. It's the worst kind of politics, Biden said on September 16th, back when it was more like 660,000 dead. We're now at more than 770,000 dead, according to world meters. Anyway, because it is putting the lives of citizens in their states, especially children, at risk, and I refuse to give in to it. Mississippi's Republican Attorney General Lynn Fitch has repeatedly expressed support for Reeves' position, I have serious concerns about the president's federal contractor vaccine mandate, Fitch said in a statement on October 27th, and those concerns have become graver as the various task forces and agencies in the federal bureaucracy have weighed in with guidance on implementing that mandate. Now, what, how'd you think it was going to go? Give him the goddamn shot. Where's my, where's, where's Greg? Greg, what, what the hell do you think that they should be doing about something like this? Everybody knows. Here we go. Oh, my f***ing God. Get the f***ing vaccine already, you yeah. f***ing f Please. Vaccine mandates have served a role throughout U.S. history, dating back to 1777 when General George Washington... I wish... I don't have any, uh, like, patriotic music to play behind stuff like this. When General George Washington ordered the mass inoculation of the Continental Army before they rammed the ramparts and took over the airports and did whatever they had to do to prevent the spread of the smallpox virus. The U.S. Supreme Court has long upheld vaccine mandates for public health reasons. Since last month, the current slate of U.S. Supreme Court justices, that's an interesting way of putting it, has rejected challenges to vaccine mandates in Maine, New York, and Indiana. Those cases were filed by individual teachers, healthcare workers, and Indiana State University, though not by the states themselves. So we'll see whether that gets them any further. Multiple surveys of Americans in August and September found that a majority of Americans support Biden's federal vaccine mandates, including 63% of respondents in a Monmouth poll, 51% of uh, respondents in a Fox News poll, and 65% in a survey conducted by a consortium of universities. Mississippi has the highest COVID-19 death rate in the nation. Despite being spared the worst of the pandemic's first few months, one of every 292 residents has now died of COVID-19. I'm behind on this. They've lowered the number even further. Before vaccination rates spiked when the Delta variant swept the state over the summer, Mississippi ranked last in COVID-19 vaccinations. 
surprisingly, they end up first in deaths. Weird. Today, 46% of Mississippians are fully vaccinated for COVID-19, below the national rate of 58%. Mississippi now ranks 46th in COVID-19 vaccinations, ahead of only Alabama, Idaho, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Reminder, uh, we did learn not that long ago that, uh, yeah, West Virginia, after starting out so well, has fallen way, way behind. U.S. House Representative Benny Thompson, Mississippi's lone Democratic representative in Congress, used social media to push back on Reeves' criticisms of Biden's mandates this morning. To date, COVID-19 has killed 10,129 Mississippians and has infected thousands more. Mississippi has the highest death rate in the country. The vaccine is about living, not liberty. The Mississippi State Department of Health confirmed another 31 deaths yesterday and six more today. COVID-19 has claimed the lives of at least nine Mississippi children, including an infant. From Daily Coast Radio, on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the k in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Okay, time for us to sign off and hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, following our show, as always, right here on Netroots Radio. And stay tuned for his collection of stories from around the country and around the world. We sign off for the week, and we'll see you Monday.